Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Frankly Speaking. I'm kind of um, excited today, and as the, um, that great game show host, uh, Steve Harvey on Family Feud always says, we got another good one for you today, ladies and gentlemen. My guest today is um, the pastor of my church, and he's been on now, this is like this fourth or fifth time, Probably. at least. Yeah. Uh, pastor Greg Odeon from the Merrimack Valley Baptist Church in Merrimack, New Hampshire. And um, I, I think what's, um, what um, prompted me to do this, I guess a couple of weeks ago, we had a situation um, in, in the state of Pennsylvania where, um, I, I guess it was inevitable to, to have happen. I guess like in circles, I, you know, I, I dabble a lot in politics on the internet and stuff like that, probably more so than I should. And the people were, were asking like, when, when do you suppose like Donald Trump might get assassinated mm -hmm. or at least an assassination attempt? And you know, you don't want to believe in it, but I mean, he's out there in the open on those, um, um, those uh, stadium rallies, campaign rallies of his, and you'd think he'd be a sitting duck, even with s Secret Service protection. Right. But lo and behold, I guess there was a situation um, the 13th of July. My, my oldest son got married that day, so I'll always remember that day forever. And, um, but I, uh, fortunately for Donald Trump, he got his ear. Well, he, it didn't blow off his ear, his, but his ear was bleeding badly. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure he was shaken up over the experience. Mm -hmm. I, I would be definitely on, on something like that. Right. And I, I don't know. And I, I guess the question is, because a lot of people were saying, you know, and Donald Trump is saying himself because he fraternizes with a lot of Christian evangelicals and ministers and stuff like that, that that was what they call divine intervention. That, you know, he just had turned his head to point out a graphic to his campaign rally. And all of a sudden he heard something whizzing by his ear. Mm -hmm. When he touched his ear, he had a handful of blood and then he ducked down. Mm -hmm. And um, and I guess that shooter managed to um, badly injure. In fact, there were more serious injuries than um then Donald Trump, one of whom was a firefighter, an mm -hmm. active firefighter, who was killed right. in, in that, that shooting. Right. But I, I guess my, my question is, to, to, to the point here, do you believe that God had, could have had an angel that intervened on Donald, Donald Trump's behalf to make, a, to make something like his will, God's will for Donald Trump isn't quite finished yet. He's not quite done with Donald Trump yet. So he had an angel maybe deflect the bullet or maybe tell, you know, signal to Donald Trump, move ahead and look at that graphic. Something, <laughs> something to that effect. But, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you've heard of, like, there is stories in, in the Bible by biblical accounts. Like somebody, uh, didn't God freeze the sun or the uh, earth to uh, give an extra day, uh, hours of daylight somewhere the in the Old Testament? Yes, in Joshua, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm waiting for the clear question. Oh. <laughs> so so yeah. I have, I have a, a few things to say, but I don't know what, what, what question you're going to ask. Okay, well, first of all, do you believe that divine intervention exists today? Um, without, without a doubt, I believe in divine intervention. But there are is, there is subsequent things that need to be said after that. It's like, do I think that what happened to President Trump was exceptional? Not necessarily. I've been nearly killed on a highway, nearly killed at an off ramp. And I'm that glad, glad that my life has been preserved. And, and I, li I would like to think that that was God protecting me. And uh, I don't deny the, um, I, I, I would actually say, you know, when I think about what could have happened to, to former President Trump, that, uh, you know, am I thankful that he's, that he survived? By all means, I'm thankful. Yeah. But, but just to be clear, I would be just as thankful if it was President Biden who was just Amen. survived. Right. Amen. So, yeah. so do I think that that uh, as a result of him surviving that assassination attempt, do I think that 
that gives a carte blanche approval of God upon Donald Trump, I would say no. I, yeah. I wouldn't say, I mean, I'm not saying that that any more than, than someone else who survives something else or, or cause, because if you take that the other way, then, then basically you're saying that uh, if someone, if, if he didn't survive and he was killed, then are we saying that's the judgment of God upon him? Or is that evil in the world being on center stage and, and we see someone get killed, right? I mean, we've seen pl plenty of people get killed. Yeah. Uh, I know of a, I mean, I was in the military, so I know a number of people who, who, who have been killed. And, and do I think that's divine judgment on them? I do not. Do I believe once they're dead, they're, they're standing before the Lord? Yeah, I do, right? As to, you know, what kind of person they were and what their status is as a, as a believer or not a believer. So those type of things are going on. So, but in terms of Donald Trump, I'm thankful that he survived. Amen. But, yeah. but we have to be careful not to assume that that means God's placed his hand of approval on him without when regard I first, for, yeah. When I first got into the, became a Christian about the mid seventies, I was like, like 19 or 20 something. One thing that I was kind of disenchanted about God about and um, I, I brought it to the biblical fellowship I was, I was involved with it at the time. I was saying, how come God loves the old, the people of the Old Testament a lot more than the people of today, the New Testament? That's... You don't see signs, miracles, and wonders like parting the Red Sea. Um, well, what, before he parted the Red Sea, didn't he have like eight plagues in Egypt? Oh, or something ten, like that. Ten plagues ten in plagues. Egypt, and, and that was yeah. supernatural. Well, I think, what, and I would, I'm more comfortable with that terminology. The more than he loved one group more than another, because God loves, right? He is love, and so when when you when you speak about most people, Frank, by the way, would say that that the God, what they would call the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament, we would say he's the same God and he's consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But most people would say that the, the God of the Old Testament is more judgmental than the God of the New Testament, right? Uh, it's the same God. Um, but, uh, and, you, and you just had it like differently. So when you talk about supernatural events, yeah, yeah, we definitely saw a lot of supernatural events in the Old Testament, but you have to remember that the, the span of time that was covered and the number of miracles that took place were relatively few compared to the New Testament when Jesus comes on the scene and he's doing miracles. Healing you know, people, every, uh, healing uh, every yeah, people yeah, that, he, yeah. that was sick that he confronted, yeah, he, I mean, he could, healed them. Yeah, he healed. Walked on water. Many, many people walked on water. Yeah. Raised somebody from the dead. Multiple people, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but since then, but, but Paul or Peter, the apostle Paul or Peter, they didn't do what well, they may have had signs, miracles, and wonders, but not the supernatural type. That well, both Peter and Paul were involved in, in uh, a person coming, well, different people, two different people, but coming back to life. Eutychus fell from the window because Paul was a long-winded teacher and, and, uh, and, and died and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit working in Paul. He was, he was resurrected. Uh, he, he, he not resurrected as in the resurrection. He was brought back to life. Uh, and Peter, the, the same is true with uh, a young girl, uh, if, I, if I have my story straight. straight. Um, you know, so, and, and yeah, so you do see, and there are, I mean, do we see the miracles today? I know that's really what you're getting at. Yeah. Why aren't we seeing the supernatural events today like we are in the, in the, in the like New the, Testament? The, the Bible um, the, the, that was running the Bible Fellowship at the time, he brought, when I said that to him, he brought me to, the, to his bathroom window in his apartment. And he says, look at that. And looking at myself, yeah. says, there's a miracle right there. Were you a believer at that time? Yes, I was. Right. So, so a supernatural event, salvation, is a supernatural event. It's not, it's not something we can do. We can't manufacture. We can't go into the science lab and re recreate it. When we talk about uh, a person coming from death to life, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, that's that's a God. That is a an act of God that is supernatural in the sense that it cannot be done any other way. So. Yes, you are a supernatural testimony to God's power. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't put her on the same plateau as like potting the Red Sea, which you just don't see these days. Right, and 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 nor should, do we need to. I mean, we we again, the planet God's plan is God's plan, 
All right, we're, he's the potter, we're the clay. We don't point our fingers and say, why this, why that? The Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, scribes within the New Testament, went to Jesus and said, hey, we want to see a sign. And he's like, no sign is going to be given to you but the sign of Jonah, which is the fact that he'll die three days later, be, re, be re, uh, rise again to, to life eternal. You know, that was the sign. They wanted to see all these supernatural events, and Jesus said, I'm God, Right? I am, I am the Savior. I'm the promised one. Believe in me. They don't need miracles anymore. They need faith. Wow. So. So, okay. And a lot of, like, the critics after that happened and stuff like that. After well, the Trump episode? After the Trump episode. Yep. And they were saying, questioning a divine, into if that could have been divine intervention. Right. Um saying that, you know, why would God, well, first of all, they brought up that firefighter. Sure. Why does God love Donald Trump and not love that firefighter? That's where, that's, that's where, that's where <laughs> when we phrase a question like that, we're, we're biasing the answer, right? So you can't answer, ask the question like that. It's not a whether or not God loves one over the other. It is the reality that God's will was that and by the way, I don't use the word divine intervention as much as I exercise the idea of sovereignty of God. All right. The sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. No one tells him what to do, where to go, where to be, what to say. Right. He is yeah. sovereign. He gets to do what he, he's going to do. But he, he must do it within his character. He's not going to he's not he, within his sovereignty. He can't choose to sin because he's holy. So he can't choose to do that. Um, so when you talk about President Trump or this firefighter, uh, you know, they're both created in the image of God. They're image bearers, as you and I are. But the, God didn't, I can't say, and I don't think anyone should say, that God loved Donald Trump more than that person. That's horrific to think that we would have a God like that. But the fact is, evil is done in this world. And yeah. evil has been done since the fall of man into sin. And evil will continue to be done until God sets everything right at Jesus' second coming. So um, the fact that that man died is is tragic. It really is. Uh, and we, so we can be sad for that, rejoice in, in that uh, President Trump uh, survived. But at the same time, we shouldn't somehow bring dishonor upon God saying that he loved one over the other. That's not even in part of the equation. I mean, evil took place. Evil takes place every day. And then a lot of the critics in um, Donald Trump's like past life. Yeah. I mean, he had a... Um, he was a hellraiser, definitely. Yeah. He said, you know, he grabbed women in funny places. Yeah. Um, well, he paid. And I guess one of the, his lawfare things that he went through, like in the past couple of months, he paid off a stripper, hush money oh, or yeah. something yeah. like that yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So and you look at like um, a lot of people would say, why the heck would God, why wouldn't he save like a, um, make a, um, a more godly man or woman to be like president or to lead America for the next four years or so instead of somebody like him. But in, in the Bible, other than Jesus Christ, isn't everyone um, like the main characters of the Bible broken or flawed men and women? Oh, Everyone but Jesus Christ is broken and flawed. Yes. Paul the Apostle. Without a doubt. Well, Paul right. the Apostle, didn't he like murder Christians before? He either, he, he certainly affirmed it, right? He affirmed the murder of, of Christians. Uh, we have David who was an adulterer and a murderer, uh, liar, you know. And, and, and so, yeah, you have Moses who was a murderer. You have all these uh, individuals, right? So, but we're all broken. We're all flawed. Um, there is none righteous, no, not one, right? Uh, we've all come fallen short of the glory of God. That's what scripture teaches. So, um, so but your question specifically. And, um, well, four years ago, I had you here when that uh, Jewish guy, Jews for Jesus, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Okay. And we're talking, comparing uh, Donald Trump with the character Jehu, which is Second Kings right, 9 right, and right, 10. Right, right. And he was, he, it was obviously he was a hell raiser. And even the people of Israel at the time saying, why would God choose him to be king of Israel? And stuff like that. Right. But he had a, one thing about that Jehu, my, when my interpretation of reading those two chapters is God knew that he could get the job done. 
See that that I I still say that's a flawed approach uh, that's because a flawed it's approach. not a, it's not about Jehu getting it done. It's God's getting it done through Jehu, or God's getting it done through someone, or God is allowing. So I I, I I'm not sure. I don't. The Jehu uh, story is not black and white to me. But as we have talked, I think I think what we're trying to to address is the idea of of President Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, okay. and um and and is he you know, why did God pick him as a, as you say, as a hell raiser, um, when to lead America for the next four years, but, but you just have to go to scripture you have to, and see all the wicked rulers that have been there. I mean, again, going back to Paul, Paul was telling people to obey the, the, um, governing authorities, Romans 13, one, right. Obey the governing authorities over you, right. There's, there's a clear command from scripture who was the command? Who was the person in charge at that time? Nero, one of the most despicable people in oh, all of history. Oh, he played the fiddle while the Rome burnt. Supposedly, the, but I'm just saying the yeah. scripture would say, you know, we're supposed to obey our governing authorities, and and so I mean, obviously there is there are limits to that in the sense of we don't get to pick and choose, but we have to when when our government or a government official would tell us to do something that violates what we know to be true in scripture. Like if a, if a politician came on your show and before the show, you know, he said, Hey, by the way, just so you know, you know, I'm going to lie, but don't tell anybody. Right. I mean, you're going to be like, what? I mean, yeah, that's just no. And, and if he told you, Hey, listen, I need you to lie for me because you're going to be like, no, I'm not going to do that. And if, a, if the president of the United States were to, uh, to tell me to lie, well, okay. When I was in the military, right. Uh, high regard for the, our, for any, of our commander in chiefs. But if a commander in chief is going to tell someone to lie, well, you know, that's a pretty simple one. Thou shalt not lie. Right. So, uh, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. That's, that's, you, that's an unlawful order. It's whatever you want to call it. Right. So the fact that someone has a good heritage or bad heritage or, or good upbringing, bad upbringing, hellraiser or, or peacekeeper or whatever it might be. Uh, the fact is, um, getting back to the point, I think is, yeah. Uh, God uses people to accomplish his will. And, but God is not guilty of the evil that is done by these people. And you just have to honestly just study the Old Testament kings uh, and see how God, uh, he, certain, even Pharaoh or the kings of Israel, uh, where they would do uh, horrible things, right? But God worked in, in the situations to bring those things about. But at the same time, he, he held them accountable for their evil. Right. And that's what I'm saying. It's like I don't I don't really care who the politician is, who the military leader is, whoever, who the local town leader is, who the police officer is, who whatever uh, it is, they're accountable for their actions. Right. And evil is done and good is done in this world. And I think God is not oblivious to it, nor uh, is he not involved he is a, a, a God who is close. I'm going on, I'm preaching now. I, I don't know what, what, where you want to go with this, but. Okay, well, I, I, there was, um, well, since I'm also quite a bit in politics on my uh, social media sites, there was a meme. In fact, I did post a meme. I should have cut it out, but I, I just forgot. And it went something like, God doesn't pick perfect people to fulfill his will. He picks people who are like perfect for the situation. And I'm looking at like uh, Donald Trump, like right now, just before that shooting, like a month or two before that shooting, he went through that lawfare thing mm -hmm. where he was sued like four times and a total of like, what, 95 federal uh, convictions or something stupid Accusations, like that. Accusations, yeah, yeah. Accusations. But I'm saying that like um, being a multi-billionaire also tied with the fact that he's got the um, personality to go to like the, on, on the social media himself and, you know, saying these are all right. crooked people or, or something like that. Right. Not everybody can can do could fulfill something like that. I mean, like to put him in jail, for example, he's got the, the billions, the multi billions to keep himself out of jail. 
by appealing and putting up the money for appeal sure. and stuff like that? I mean, yeah, he ultimately he can't control whether he goes to jail or not, but certainly he has the money to fight it according to the system. But I, like, I'm you, not an expert on me. On, you or 90 percent and 99 percent of the people watching this don't have the financial no, wherewithal. No. I'd say, you know, if, if you're going to keep appealing and appealing it, I guess I'll have to go to jail and wait for my appeal to pop up or whatever. But I would still say is, again, I don't, I'm not sure where we're going with this particular question, but I mean, yeah. Donald Trump is Donald Trump and I'm Greg Odiorn and he has billions and I don't. So okay. that's, that's not any fault of his. I mean, he's had success and those, that's his yeah. money. And I mean, he's responsible for how he, how he earned it. And, and so I'm responsible for how I spend my money. And so it, I, it almost, it seems like you're maybe saying there's a disparity there well, there is only because of his situation of life versus my situation in life. But I don't think there's anything wrong yeah. with his situation in life. And there's rich people. There's always been rich people. You know, Solomon was the richest person, I think, in history. You know, Correct. And, you know, yeah. so. Um, but like, OK, well, wasn't there an, in the New Testament, was it Peter, Paul or both of them that were locked up and then God created an earthquake and they walked out of jail? Or something like that. Okay, so oh. Peter was in jail and uh, chained to two uh, Roman soldiers, and then an angel came and released them, and they walked out of that prison. And oh, no and, way and then quick. Paul was in prison with Silas, I believe it was, and then that's when the her when the earthquake happened and the chains fell off, and the Philippian jailer was going to uh, kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped, and Paul stopped him, and says, "No, we haven't moved. We're right here. We're all accounted for." And then a Philippian jailer came to faith in Christ that night. Yeah. So what I'm saying is I, that's not going to happen to everybody. I mean, like, um, like most people, Christian or non-Christian or atheist even, I mean, if they're found guilty of a felony, they usually wind up, wind up spending time in jail or whatever. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, yeah. depending on what happens in the courts, I mean, uh, Trump's former President Trump's money is not going to save him from from a legal decision to put him in jail. I mean, it's just I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yes. He's got a lot of influence. And yes, he's a former president. And yes, there's all kinds of things that he could use to his advantage. But he's accountable to that is what I'm saying. He's accountable to God for how he uses his power, resources, money, as we all are. Right. We are accountable to those things. So, I mean, he might seem to get away with things in this life. And, and let me back off of that for a second, because I'm really not an expert on President Donald Trump. I'm saying anybody yeah. who would who would do wrong, right, they're accountable and they're not getting away from with it in God's eyes, because there's always eternity uh, to, to face. That's true, right? too. So, but um, I'm a little uncomfortable focusing so much on Donald Trump because I don't yeah. know him and uh, personally. I mean, I, we can only go by his record, but just like every other politician. Okay, so why don't we slide? Now, you told me that the next um, the next two months, on the Wednesday you have right. at the Merrimack Valley Baptist Church, every Wednesday you have a Bible study. And uh, from, it starts at what, 6.30? 6.45. 6.45. 6.45 to 8 o'clock every Wednesday night. Uh, it's going on even tonight, but uh, the, yeah. the series that you're talking about starts next Wednesday. Okay, so the months of September, October. Right, we're, we're doing a series, okay. uh, just a short series on uh, seeing politics and people through the eyes of Jesus. And, and, the, and the, the motivation for this is that we live, when you look at the, the statistics and even the, the polls for po politics, we are a divided country. We're almost right down the middle. And, and that's, that's not a healthy place to be. But even in the midst of that, you have Christians, uh, you know, who are separating from one another and having difficulties being in fellowship and, and because of what's going on in politics. And I just think that's backwards, right? Our, uh, one of my pet peeves is that people who, f I, I, for Christians, it's for Christians I'm talking about, is that when they find their identity in their political party or a political candidate more than they... Uh, identify with their salvation in Christ and in the person of Christ, right? So um, we are called as brothers and sisters in Christ to be unified. Not That unity does not mean we agree in everything, but we, we find our foundation, the gospel, 
not our political views. And, and I'm telling you in the last, you know, at least since the last election, a lot of division has taken place. And my hope is that by talking about the things we're gonna talk about, we're gonna to go to scripture, look at the stories within scripture, the true stories, the historical accounts uh, detailed for us in scripture about how Jesus dealt with politics and people. One of the things I'm hoping to accomplish, uh, hopefully I will succeed, is to help us to see that politicians are people and that we should not hate them. If they're, whether the opposing party, current party, turncoat, whatever someone might wanna say, is like, no, these are people and, and we have to look at them as people. And, and I have a lot of story behind that, but I'll let you ask your questions. <laughs> and um, well, one thing I say, though, like a lot of the banter I get involved with on, on the, my social media sites, I say, you know, one thing for sure here, I mean, granted, um, Donald Trump has his faults. He's no angel, but Jesus Christ is not on the ballot in the 2024 um, presidential election. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Democrat, um, the nominee is no angel either. Correct. So <laughs> right. No one is, right? Yeah. So, and also, I, 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 I thought of this before, that let's say, okay, let's say he, Jesus was a candidate and somebody asked him, Jesus, so what's your opinion on abortion? In America, he'd be probably already eliminated right after that. And do you want to give federal funds to Planned Parenthood, Jesus? Well, he's, he's already, already answered those questions, so he he wouldn't need to because he said, "Thou shalt not kill." Right? So, I mean, <laughs> uh, so I would I would just say that uh, he's not a political candidate. I agree. He's he's uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's God of Presidents. Um, so, I mean, I I know what you're saying in, yeah. in a fictional way, trying to but, but, yeah. but, but it, 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 you can't bring Jesus into that category because he is. He is currently King of Kings. It's not going to be King of Kings. He is, yeah, I'll say, Already King of king Presidents. Of I mean, he, it, it doesn't matter who's on, uh, who's in the White House. Jesus is on the throne. So, um, and and Scripture clearly says that anyone in, who is in in power in the governing authorities, right, at whatever, are there at, at God's behest, right? God's allowed them to be there. They're accountable for what they do in that office, but but they're not there you know, without God knowing it, right? And I would say, as I, as I think about the church, I'm trying to stay in my lane. My lane is yeah. the church. I'm a pastor of a church. I don't endorse a candidate. Uh, I will lead people to, to basically pursue faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Um, but as a result of that, I mean, I'm saying, as we look at the world, and then we'll, we'll talk about this some on Wednesday nights, but Christianity is flourishing under communist China, okay? I mean, think about that. And now communist China would say it's illegal to gather as a church, but yet there are many people gathering for church because their, their view would be we're going to obey God rather than man because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a clear law that is in violation of God's law, right? So, but that's a perfect situation where we're, we're arguing over some very important things here in the United States. Um, but we're, that's our political system. We're allowed to argue. But you have communist China where they're not even allowed to argue and and um, and yet Christianity is thriving, and and you know what I'm saying. It, it's we ha we take God out of the picture a lot when it comes to our politics, um, and you just you can't do that because He's there, whether you want to acknowledge Him or not, He's there. But you still um, encourage, I would assume, that like the members of um, Merrimack Valley Baptist Church exercise their right to vote. And maybe to participate I, in town halls. Well, again, we live in a, in a um, democracy, right? So, so uh, we have the right to vote. Yeah. Um, but isn't I will there a say thing that this election and the last election, maybe the last two elections, it's been very difficult yeah. for us to, to and that, you know, do I, would I say they have to vote? No, because they have the freedom to not vote as well, exactly. right? Exactly. And it, it has to be done in faith, and it has to be done as a matter of conscience. If you in good conscience cannot vote for either candidate, you may choose to not vote. I'm not going to put somebody down for that. Yeah. And people will use uh, logic and to say, well, if you don't, then it's a really a vote for that. Well, that's your opinion. But yeah. we have to abide by our own conscience and by the will of God. And, 
And so certainly issues such as abortion and euthanasia and, and different, different um, those or, type things, um, gun control, they're important things to talk about. Um, is um, an, another thing I, I told we talked a little bit before the uh, cameras started rolling here about um, I watch like two um, Christian networks, Daystar and the Trinity Broadcasting Network, and they have an annual share to raise money for their uh, mission and stuff like that at their TV studio. One day of uh, one day in the week they dedicate to money for Israel. Because mm -hmm. I think there's an Old Old Testament scripture said where God says, you know, you bless my people, I bless you. You curse my people, I curse you, or something to that effect. And they're staunch believers, these Christians, that you should at least give like one day a week to the people of Israel. So is that a, a, a usually a topic that or you, you just stay out of your lane on when, when it comes to like um, this U.S., United States support of Israel um, versus non-supporting Israel. Or uh, well, in this see, case, I, I think the this Hamas, is, again, again yeah. well, now finish your statement. You just brought up Hamas. Okay, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, we have the situation now right. with Palestine and Hamas. Right. And um, it's just a pickle. The Democrats seem to be having more of a problem there because their presidential nominee is torn between the Palestine and Hamas. Especially in Congress, you have some Palestine Congress people who are from that neck of the woods. Palestinian, yeah. Palestinians. Right. Right. And you have some staunch Jewish people sure. that are kind of... But the, the, uh, Trump, on the other hand, seems to be straight for Israel to be a supporter for Israel. Right, so what you say. just established is uh, people have a lot of opinions, uh, yeah. right? Okay, and, yeah. and, and that's what politics is all about. But how are we going to arrive at conclusions? What decisions are gonna be made as a, as a government? And I would say uh, that historically, the United States has supported Israel, and I have no problem with that. Uh, historically, the United States has supported many democracies, In right? Ukraine, I mean, they, yeah. they, are, they are support, we support a lot of countries, yeah, right? We do. <laughs> um, but we, uh, I think, I do think that um, there's, Israel is unique. I mean, I, I do think there's a distinction there. Um, I do think that, that God has worked in, in, in through the nation of Israel in a way that he has not worked through any other people in this world. Um, and so I, I would say that um, when it comes to what has happened, I think Israel has a right to defend itself. I think if our nation decides to support them, then, then, okay, our nation has decided to support them. But at the same time, they are also responsible if, if the Palestinians are having uh, issues with how Israel is doing things. Uh, if, if it's, if, I don't know, I'm not behind the scenes. I'll just throw that caveat yeah. out there. I don't know. But I would say, we certainly don't want Israel doing wrong, right? I mean, we, we don't want that. Uh, and, the, and the media bias that is prevalent in every media outlet that exists on this earth and has ever existed, right? There's no unbiased media. Um, they're gonna say, they're gonna say what they're gonna say uh, to, to drum up support for whatever. I'm telling you, right? That's why we need God. <laughs> Says, Amen. you know, to, to, to sort this all out. We're not going to. So I would say Israel has a right to defend itself, but Israel doesn't have the right to do wrong or evil. I mean, I'm not saying they are. I, I, I hope they're not, right? But what was done to them and all those volunteers and the hostages that still exist, that's wrong. And it ought to be condemned and it ought to be dealt with politically uh, in, in some fashion, right? Uh, but that's, again, that's, that's my opinion as Greg Odiorn. Uh, it's, I would say because God's on the throne, you know, we ought, to seek, we ought to seek right to be done. And who defines right? God defines right. If God didn't define right, we would be in chaos. Ah. Uh -huh. And I don't, well, I don't, I, I don't know if I can blame the presidents per se here. I'm not sure if it's a national situation or a state or local situation. Is this gender reassignment surgery? Okay. Switching and gears. The, okay. Switching yeah. gears. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the, the governor of Minnesota, 
It's it's legal now that a, like a kid from like New Hampshire or Massachusetts, a teenager, let's say 15, 16 years old, can go to Minnesota and they can claim um, like sanctuary. They're like a sanctuary free from their parents. OK. And they can get gender reassignment surgery courtesy of the government of the state of um, Minnesota. Yeah, I don't know that to be true. I'm not an expert on that. I don't, I actually, I'm not even a novice at that. I don't know how to take whatever you're saying. But for... parents, parents should have the right to, um, to do what the parent, kids are going to do before they're 18 or 21, I would assume. Well, I mean, even, I'm, even yeah, if they've escaped to Minnesota. But again, to stay in my lane, I would say yes. But the question is why, right? Why should parents have the rights to know? I am a father of three children. Uh, for someone to to lead my child to do something that I'm not knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about, I believe would be wrong. But I would say, why is it wrong? I think as God instituted government, God instituted family, God instituted, uh, it's, it's our parents are our parents, right? We are the primary, excuse me, our, our children, we are parents of our children. We are the primary caregivers. Uh, for, the, for the government to step in and, and somehow take the rights of parents away is wrong. And I would say, I'll base yeah. that on scripture, not on constitution or whatever, I'll say on scripture, even in, even in communist China, they understand that parents are the parents of the children. You know, I mean, it's wherever you go. So these decisions that are being made, yeah, they're wrong. And that's why I think Christians ought to be involved in politics. But they ought to be involved in politics with a, with a foundation upon a knowledge of Scripture and what it actually teaches and on, a, on a, uh, the foundation of the gospel it would be preferable for me uh, that they would understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and act accordingly. And that means not hate speeding, hate speeching against the the other candidates and and dragging up. It's like no, let's just fight for the. Let's get back to the way the pol politics used to be in our early country, which was you talked about the issues, you didn't defame the individuals as a course of political um, power, right? I mean, you you actually fought about the issues. Um, so I, I love to see that come back where we're just dealing with the issues and not demeaning yeah. people and tearing people down. And, and, uh, and, and I'm saying on, on all sides and certainly in the eyes of Christians, we should not be trash talking candidates. I hear you. And I was going to bring up too. again, I'm not sure if this is like statewide or locally where you have drag queens reading a story hour to children mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. And you also have like you have books like children's books for like six, seven year olds, you know, my two dads right. and all right. kinds of weird things right. of photos and um, yeah. statements no, in yeah, those books. Yeah. I mean, I think we should have a right. I banning call it banning books or whatever like that. But I don't think there's any place in. Well, um, let's just. I mean, let's just be. I mean, we live in America, right? Yeah. So we have a constitution. We have amendments to that constitution. We have a bill of rights. We have we have those things, and those are the things that guide guide the way we do government. And that's the way we do things. So, um, again, these. The, the things such as, as what you're explaining, I'm not in favor of those things. Uh, at the same time, I will say a, uh, a transgender person is still a person, right? I mean, they're yeah. still a person. Uh, a drag queen is, and, and, and thankfully you and gave me a little heads up that you might talk about this. Uh, you know, I had to look that one up and to see what that was all about. And even in the articles I read, some very good points were made on the, on the part of those that would be okay with the trans, or excuse me, with the uh uh, drag queen um, uh, reading. Uh, but well, I'll say on the positive side, what they said was, uh, one, they're entertainers. Like, okay, okay, okay I'm, I, I agree, they're an entertainer at some point. Uh, now, some of their entertainment is, is probably more on an adult nature, not a child's nature. But I, I still say they, they have, so th that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that we ought to be consistent. If we're not going to have a drag queen read a book, should we allow a, a pastor who's been unfaithful to his wife or a child molester read a book? Well, no, we wouldn't want that either, right? Uh, I think there's a certain, we, I think what's going on within many circles is, is a fear. We're trying to bring fear in and we're controlling people by fear. 
And I thought this article, again, it was just a basic article. I didn't read much about it, but I thought it was, it was a good point. It was like, so, so we're going to, people are fearful of a drag queen and children because they're worried about, well, will this, will this child be groomed? Right? That's what the article was saying, right? Well, probably it's less likely that that's going to happen in a public forum with someone who's obviously at center stage, right? Like such a, a drag queen reading in a, in a library. I think there ought to be more concern about uh, religious leaders and anyone in authority with children. That's where we, you know, we ought to be balanced and, 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 and consistent with our concerns. But we should not use fear to, to divide people and rally people around a cause. That's, that's not good humanity, right? Let's just be honest and truthful. Let's fight the good fight. Going back to the drag queen reading, I think there's enough other things within that context that would say, that's, that's not necessarily a thing that I would want in my local community, right? Yeah. Because, not because of the individual reading. That person's a human being, right? But it's what that person has chosen to do for their livelihood or chosen to do uh, in, in the way. And so there, you, you're not, we're not uh, vacuums, right? We all come with baggage. And so whoever it is, you know, there, if but the motivation for that drag queen to be reading in the library, what is that motivation? We ought to ask ourselves, what is the motivation? And, and then we ought to wrestle with it. And then I would say, since we're talking about politics, is that individuals need to exercise their, their political influence through whatever measures are available within their town, their city, within their, their government, right, to affect change but they don't need to do it through fear or power mongering or anything like that. Okay. Now, talk about an off the wall thing. I want to bring this up and bounce it off of you. Um, speaking about the social media things, um, two pundits, two conservative pundits that kind of had a falling out with each other. Mm -hmm. Ben Shapiro, who's like, he's not only a, a, a Republican a conservative pundit, he's also very Jewish. And a lot of time he goes yeah. on these shows. You're either the, Jewish or not Jewish, I think. But he's, uh, he, okay. yeah, he's got the yarmulke. <laughs> sure. That makes him he's an practiced, official Jew. Well, he's, yeah, he is Jewish. He's Jewish, yes. Jewish. And there's another one that um, a, a black lady, uh, um, Owen. Owens, Camille Owens, okay. Candace Owens, anyway, and she made the statement back when Nikki Haley was still in the Republican primary. She endorsed Nikki Haley for the president of Israel. So I, I know making a joke, I guess, okay. against it to kind of needle this guy, Ben Shapiro. Yeah. And then um, somebody made a statement on the thing saying, um, I, I think maybe it was Candace Owens made the thing saying that Christ is king. And he came back, Ben Shapiro, saying that he thought that's a very anti-Semitic remark, saying that Christ is king. Okay. So some people who took their sides, some of these pundits on podcasts on YouTube, have what they call merchandise on the side. Yeah. And they printed these T-shirts and sweatshirts that says Christ is king. Okay. And uh, sold them. And I'm just wondering if like an atheist Republican who really want to needle Ben Shapiro bought one of these T-shirts or sweatshirts saying Christ is king. How do you think like Jesus would look at that saying, OK, well, first of all, there's an atheist that's wearing a shirt that says Christ is king, but he's not really acknowledging me as king. He's just doing that to kind of needle Ben Shapiro. Well, I'll go to scripture. All right. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind when you say that is the <laughs> high priest in Israel. All right. When he's talking to the Sanhedrin, uh, trying to convince people at that point that it's, it's more profitable for one to die for the nation. Right. So he was saying he was telling this religious leader saying it's OK to kill Jesus because it'll it'll calm things down or we'll get rid of them. Right. Um, because it, it, but he says it's more profit. I think it's, it's more beneficial. It's more profitable that one should die for the many. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was going to die for the many. And, 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 and uh, in Scripture, and I, I didn't come prepared to, to ex expand on this, but I will say in Scripture it says, as the high priest, he was it was a prophecy, right? He said words that were true. 
he is talking, he is the person that's going to be responsible for turning Jesus over to Pilate. He's going to be, you know, and he is saying, but he's actually prophesying as, as an evil person. He's saying it's more profitable that Christ should die for the many. That's true. So if an atheist is going to wear a shirt that says Christ is king, okay. it is truth, right? Now, going back to your uh, previous with Ben Shapiro and, and this uh, African-American uh, female politician, you know, I don't know what happened there. I, I wasn't. Well, but well, it they, could be. But see, it could be in that setting, because if the context is you're if Ben Shapiro's in the room and he's part of the comp, conversation. Right. Christians, Christians and, and Jew and Jewish people worship the same God as in God, same, the father. Yes. God, the father. We recognize Jesus as God. They do not. In that context, was it wise for that? And was it was it anti-Semitic? I mean, I think it could be spun that way, not too, too difficultly, where it's kind of true. Her, her motivation may have been to bring that up at his expense as a Jew. That comes across to me as anti-Semitic. You know, that she that her motivation may have been that. I wasn't there. What okay. I'm saying, though, is it wrong for uh, an atheist to wear the shirt, Jesus is king? Whether it's wrong for them or not, whether they're doing it for whatever their moral reasons are, it's true regardless, but they're also accountable for their motivation for wearing that shirt, right? Just because they're wearing a shirt doesn't mean God's happy with the reason they're wearing the shirt. Yeah, isn't there a scripture, I don't know if this is relative, that God used the, the devices of the enemy for good or switched right, in, to the weapons? In, in, uh, in Psalm... Uh, I think it's Psalm one. I think it's Psalm 141. I, I could be, I forget because when I was a chaplain in the military and we deployed to, um, Iraq, uh, I printed off this Psalm. It's 140, 141, I believe, but it talked about, uh, I was in a, a unit that had a trucking company, a trunk, a company yeah. of trucks, right? A military company size. And there, they were doing convoys every night. And so I printed off this passage and I taped it in every one of the trucks. Um, just to encourage people. And the, it was a prayer that I, I was putting forth. It's scripture, but it's, it's like, Lord, we pray that the enemy would fall into their own traps. Oh, right? Okay, something. So yeah. it's, it's the idea. So that's the way. So going back to your question, I, I don't know if that's what you're referencing, but that's what's happened in my life where I'm like, Lord, I pray that, that one, I pray you preserve life. So whether it's Trump, Biden, or anybody, right? Even the shooter, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I would be glad that life is preserved. Now, right has to be done in, in response to that, right? I'm, I'm not saying, but but at the same time, so I'm, know, now I'm getting myself off track, but I, I would just say that, um, you know, for us to pray that the enemy would fall into their own traps, we're saying, God, you are sovereign. Cause this to be where, where evil would be vanquished yeah. and good would Come on, come in fact, on. I think there's a contemporary Christian uh, song that um, that uses that verse. I, if it's not in the title, it's definitely in the lyrics. Okay, not that he uh, God it. uses the the, uh, the uh, devices of the enemy. Oh, I'm sure. For I good. Mean, yeah, I'm, uh, well, he he is sovereign. He is able to use the devices of the enemy for good. He can turn it around on themselves and and yeah, cause cause harm to come upon them. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, okay, one more thing. I, I guess we have like less than nine. We're making great time here. Yeah. But then we had a lot of lot of stuff to talk yeah. about. But here we have a, a situation where my youngest son was in kind of a pickle here. He Well, he asked me to get him a Bible, if I could pick him up a Bible, like about a year or so ago. So I picked him up. I know a place, a service station in Nashua, that has a ministry where they give like free Bibles. Yeah. So I picked up a King James Bible, gave it to him. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, th this is kind of a tough thing to, to get through. To I think God probably had uh, rocket scientists geared on his heart because <laughs> it's so hard to understand and stuff and get through some of these passages. So I did something I thought I'd never do. When I first got in, in uh, born again, the uh, cult that I was involved with they uh, denounced this uh, version of the Bible. It was called the Living Bible mm -hmm. in the, the mid '70s. I don't okay. know if you were in, sure. In I know home. of it. I know of it. And yeah. it had a kind of psychedelic thing. It was called the Way on yeah. the but, yeah. yeah. That, uh, that, yeah. Okay, but anyway, 
that Bible was created in the mid 70s to understand it like if you were reading a newspaper, like the National Telegraph, New Hampshire Union Leader, like an American reading an American newspaper sure, sure. instead of King James English. Right. And it's very comprehensible. Right. So I did get him that. And lo and behold, um, he, he, he's reading it. He's reading like, I guess it not only has like the, um, the thing in um, scripture and stuff like that. But one thing that that cult was telling me that they was so against this living Bible in Romans 13, in fact, we, I think you mentioned Romans 13 about being obedient to government. The governing and, authorities. And yeah. being obedient to uh, police officers because God put police officers, you know, on the earth. Mm -hmm. But yet you have like situations like the Serpico movie, the only movie that Al Pacino ever played a good guy in, where they played <laughs> dirty cops in New York. <laughs> But I mean, there's bad apple, there's probably bad ministers, there's bad without postal a workers. Without a doubt. So, and I, bad I don't Bad talk know. show individuals, maybe. Bad talk show individuals, <laughs> there you go. But um, how do you um, figure, because also when you go to the other side of the pendulum on police officers, you had that situation like four years ago, like in Minneapolis, yeah. uh, Seattle, and stuff right. like that, right. where they had defund the police, right. and the, the, the people went nuts when right. that guy George Floyd was killed. Right. which I, I don't think justified all the destruction and the murders that took place when that guy died because of well, one stupid cop. Okay, well, yeah, you, you're but, actually touching on something that's... Uh, okay, I would well, say, first of all... No, is, I would say it's volatile. I would say what you're talking about is volatile okay. and important. I mean, because, listen, George Floyd died. Yeah. Right? And, and I remember back when that happened, I never said anything from the pulpit at my church about it initially, right? I don't know if I ever said anything uh, that would have been redeeming and, and helpful, but he died and it was violence uh, and it was wrong. And yes, and I think it was more than one cop, one cop certainly, but I yeah. think there was other cops that lost their jobs and probably went to jail. Uh, but that, that, that evil is going on all over the world, okay? And, and so I'm not sure how we got here. I think you went to. You, oh, yeah, okay. Well, let me just well, clarify. truth and accuracy. Well, we started the with the New here. Living Translation. Well, actually, Correct. the New Living. You went to the New Living, living Bible. You, well, actually, yeah. you went to the Living Bible, which later became the New Living Translation, Correct. which is a much more accurate. It's a translation. The, yeah. the Living Bible was not a translation. It was what you said. Just trying to put it in plain English so people can. The New Living Translation is a translation, they, as I understand it, and they have tried to stick to the, the Greek and the Hebrew and, and Aramaic and all that stuff. So, but when it, when it says in Romans 13 to, um, you know, obey the governing authorities, I mean, I kind of touched on that already, but as, but yeah, I think that would include police officers. I think that would include, um, but, but it's, but it's not carte blanche in the sense that they get to do evil while we're having to be obedient to them. Right. Um, we are called to be obedient to the law. And laws are put there, uh, at least in theory and in most practice, the thought law is put there for the benefit of people, right? But laws are violated by both police officers, government officials, pastors, you know, people are violating the laws all the time, right? But uh, again, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what your point is there. Uh, well, I guess I, get, I was kind of getting off on a tangent, too, that the living Bible, I mean, it, whether it is in, in as accurate and truthful as the King James Version, the New International Version, the Amplified Bible, I mean, my child, my son should grasp okay, the Bible. I'm ready to talk about that, but you started with that, I'm and then sorry. you brought in all this other very heavy stuff, and I want to I want to treat it respectfully. Okay. Right. So we'll transition back to translations, and sure. I will say, I will say, there's uh, the the King James has a strong heritage of historical heritage of being a very uh, accurate and and uh, beneficial translation. Right. Uh, we. I would say that I'm not in favor of its continued use in in the United States, maybe in the maybe in England, England or somewhere they're Australia, using that term. Yeah. But it is it is a it, if it, if the word of God is not understood, it cannot be obeyed. Amen. 
So what my son was trying to say with the rocket scientists. Yeah, well, and that's what I'm saying. It is written. I remember re- hearing a statistic, and, and someone could prove me wrong on this. I, I'm just repeating what I heard. But the King James version is really written or on a college level, um, and and because uh, but even then there are other accurate translations. Do I think we need a new translation? Not in English. I don't. You know, there's four or five or six of them out there that are faithful and, and, and good. The Amplified Bible is not a translation. It's an amplified. It's actually trying to, it's actually trying to give nuances. And, and so it's not a straight up translation. Uh, it actually is bringing in a lot of different factors. And I think it's beneficial trying to help us understand the nuances of words. Um, but we're running out of time. And I would just yeah. say, whatever Bible you have, be reading it. If you don't understand it, get one you understand. Yeah. Yeah. If you have any questions, come talk to me. Yeah. One of my last <laughs> ministers uh, said that. So when they asked him about, you know, comparing King James to like the, the new international version, right. he said the one you study and uh, read is the one that you should, uh, the version you should. I got should saved continue. reading my Roman Catholic Bible. There you go. My first Bible that someone gave me as a Christian was the NIV. Then I it was the King James. Now I'm the ESV, the New King James. I was just, every one of them, if you will read them and come to know Jesus through them, through that, uh, your life will be changed. Excellent, excellent. Our loyalty is to our Savior, not to the translation. It's to His Word, and all those are are, are valuable word. I mean, they're they're accurate words, right? Amen. Yes. And if there's a difference between the words, study deeper. Right. Study Amen. More. Yeah. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, if this has been a blessing for you, boy, we really made some good. Well, we yeah. had a lot to talk about. We had a full plate yeah. uh, ahead of us. And um, but if you want to uh, take advantage of um, the Wednesday night um, Bible fellowship at yeah. 645, 645 to eight, starting next Wednesday night, next Wednesday night, all through October. Right. And we'll have a good insight a perspective, so to speak, on the Christianity and politics, which should be um, interesting. Let's hope it is. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a blessing to you. Stay tuned for the next episode of Frankly Speaking. Thank you very much.